If you haven't seen my video on magnetic fields and the motor effect yet, then make sure you go and see that one first. But if you have, let's move on to free moving charged particles in magnetic fields. So we said that if we have a wire that's in a magnetic field and it's carrying a current, then it will feel a force. In this case, field's going into the page, current's going out that way to the right. So the force is going to be upwards like this. Now, why does this happen? This happens because inside of this wire, we have electrons moving and electrons are charges. If there's a current, then that means that electrons are flowing in this wire. Now, here's the thing though. We said that current in a wire is conventional current. So that's actually the way that positive charges are moving. So actually in our wire, if we blew this up, showed everything a little bit larger, we would see the electrons actually flowing in this direction. It's really important that when we use Fleming's left-hand rule, that when we're talking about the second finger here, your middle finger, the current, that is actually the opposite way to which electrons are flowing. Now that's not that important when we talk about wires because we just draw an arrow showing which direction the current is in. But it does matter when we have free electrons. So this is for our wire. This is for a free electron. So if we have a magnetic field like this, and the electron comes in, gets fired into this magnetic field. Just like the electrons in this wire here, this electron here is going to feel a force. So let's get our Fleming's left-hand rule and figure out which way this force is going to be felt. Field's going into the page due to our dart rule. Which way is the current going? The current is not going upwards because it's an electron that's going upwards. So what we need to do is flip our finger the other way. Even though the electron's going upwards, our conventional current is actually pointing the other direction. So second finger goes down like that. The force here, the thumb thrust, is going to be to the right. I'll put a little left there. So look at this. We have a force that is at 90 degrees to the electron's velocity. Let's take a snapshot of what's happened in a couple of seconds time. Our electron is now there and its velocity is going that way. Let's get our left hand again. So field's going in again. Current is not going up in that direction. It's actually going the opposite way to the electron. So again, our thumb is pointing at 90 degrees to its velocity. Here we have a force that is always perpendicular to the electron or any charged particles velocity. What's going to happen therefore? It's going to go in a circle. Let's pretend that it was already in the magnetic field. We have a circular motion. And that is because force is perpendicular to the velocity at any given time. What does that mean? Speed is constant, therefore kinetic energy is constant too. So unlike if we fire an electron into an electric field where we do get acceleration, that is it's speed changing, what happens in a magnetic field when you have a free charge, it actually goes in a circle, its speed stays the same. Now it only goes in a perfect circle like this if the electron or the charged particle's velocity is on the plane that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. If a particle's velocity isn't on the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field, then that means that only part of its velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. That means that that component of the velocity will be affected by the magnetic field, but the other component that's going parallel with the magnetic field won't be. So what happens? Its velocity in the direction of the field is unchanged, but its velocity perpendicular to the field is affected and it goes in a circular motion. Put those together and it actually spirals. So that's what happens with charged particles that do not have a velocity that's 90 degrees to the magnetic field, they spiral. Let's just have a think about an ion instead. It's a positively charged particle. Let's extend our magnetic field out here. What's going to happen to this if its velocity is going upwards like that? Let's get our left hand rule again. Field's going in. Current is going up this time because you said this current is the flow of positive charges, so the force is to the left. What's going to happen? This ion is actually going to move in a circle as well. But notice that I've drawn a bigger circle. There is a reason for that. 
Say that we've got our electron again, and we see it go in a circle like so. The force on a charge carrying wire is F bill, F equals B I L. But for a charged particle, just moving freely in a magnetic field, it's this B Q V. It's the flux density times the charge of that particle times its speed at that point. This speed here, this velocity, has to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, though, in order for this to be true. For an electron, that's going to be that instead, because the charge of an electron is E. So if we know that our force at any point is this, if it's going in a circle of radius R, then we know that this force on the charged particle, the electron in this case, is going to be equals to the centripetal force needed to make it go around in this circle here. So what do we know to be true? We know that B Q V, I'm going to leave it as Q for now, equals what's the centripetal force on an object? M V squared over R. How do we find out what the radius of this circle is going to be? We need to find R equals, but look at this already, we can cancel out one of these V's and rearranging it, we can get to this here. R equals mv over bq. That's the mass of the particle times its speed over magnetic flux density times its charge. For an electron or a singularly charged ion, this is going to be little e, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. If our radius is proportional to mv and inversely proportional to b and q, an electron which is very light, then its radius is going to be very small. What we see in a cloud chamber is if an electron goes in, it actually goes in a circle, but then it spirals round very tightly. Why does it do that? Well, because it's losing energy as it knocks into uh, the particles in the cloud chamber. But it goes in this circle here, in this spiral here, and it loses kinetic energy. But the point is that its radius of that spiral is very small to begin with. If we have an, an ion instead, is going to be heavy because it has a bigger mass its radius is going to be bigger so it's going to end up going like this so that's how you can deduce what kind of particles we have going through a cloud chamber if they have a big radius then that means that they are heavy or they're going fast but if they go in the same speed then obviously the mass is going to be different and we can tell what charge they are because they go in opposite directions. Incidentally, pair production of electrons and positrons end up in two spirals that are exactly the same radius, but they are of course spinning in opposite directions. They have the same mass, same speed, but they are do have the opposite charge, so they're going to spin in opposite directions. So what can this be used for? This can be used for something called mass spectroscopy, that is finding the mass of particles. Now we said just now that R equals mv over bq, because we know that the force on a particle is equal to the centripetal force. But if we're trying to find m, then we can rearrange this to find what the mass of a particle is. By rearranging this, we have bqr over v. So in order to find out the mass of a charged particle in a magnetic field, we know the flux density of the magnetic field that's going through, its charge, its radius, of its circle and its speed. So if we want to find the mass of ions, what we need to do is get rid of an electron of a particle. An atom could be a molecule as well. They can still be ions. And we need to fire them into a magnetic field. So let's say that we fire these ions into a magnetic field. The easiest way of telling what ions you have is by having a film and the lighter particles have a tighter curve, and therefore they hit the film here. Heavier ones, they have a bigger radius. You can actually tell what isotopes or what particles, the mass of what particles you have in your sample just by looking at how far along this film the dots actually are. In this case, the radius is going to be half the distance from where they entered 
to where they hit the film. It isn't the best way of doing things though because you can't tell the relative abundance. You can't tell how many of each you have because it's just particles hitting a film. So what if we have some sensors that are precisely lined up for a specific radius of curvature for a certain mass of an ion. So we have three sensors here. So let's say that we've got a sample of some iron atoms. We ionize them and we have some very light ions hitting this sensor here. So let's say that that is iron 55. Then we have the next one. And let's say this is iron 56. And then we have some even heavier ones, iron 57, reaching this sensor over here. Using this, you can actually count up how many of each ion hits each detector and find out their relative abundance. The problem with this is that in order for this to work, you need them to have all the same speed regardless of their mass. So how do we do this? We do this with a velocity selector. So what do we have in here? We have a magnetic field. And this magnetic field, if it's going into the page and the ions are going that way, then that means that the force is going to be upwards on here. I'm going to call that FB. That's the force due to the magnetic field. But they're going straight through. In order to get them to go straight through, we need a force that is equal and opposite. And we achieve this with charged plates on either side. And that gives us an electric field. So we have the force due to magnetic field and a force due to an electric field. What's the force due to the magnetic field? Well, like we said earlier, that's B, Q, V. But in order to go straight through, we know that the force due to the magnetic field has to be equal to the force due to the electric field as well. And that ends up being E, Q. E being the electric field strength. Incidentally, that's equal to the potential difference divided by the separation of the plates. So if that's D there, and this is our V, then that's how we can calculate the electric field strength. So if we cancel all of this down, whoa, that's kind of weird. Charge actually cancels out. We rearrange for V, we end up with this. In order for a particle to go straight through, the force due to the magnetic field being equal to the force due to the electric field, then it must have a speed that is equals to the electric field strength. That's not energy. Be careful. The electric field strength divided by the magnetic flux density. And that's how we select four velocities. Notice that this does not have mass in there at all. So it doesn't matter what the mass of a particle is. It's always going to work. Notice also that it doesn't have charge in there either. So actually, you can have ions that are singly charged, doubly charged, or charged completely oppositely, and it will not matter. So the last thing to do with the motor effect is this, cyclotrons. No, it's not the name of a transformer. It's actually the name of a piece of equipment. We can use it to create a single stream of high energy protons that can be used in nuclear physics or it can be used in medical situations as well, proton therapy and the like. So what does it look like? Well, we have the place where the protons come out like that. And that makes half a circle. And then we have this other thing as well. These are called Ds for obvious reasons. So we have our source in the middle and it's giving out these protons in, it's giving out the protons in every direction. What do we want to do? We want them to spiral outwards though, regardless of where they started, end up coming out of the end there. And of course we have a magnetic field. In this case, it's coming out of the page towards us in order to make sure that the force exerted on the particle is always towards the center of the cyclotron. So what do we need? We need radius to increase. How on earth do we do that? Well, we accelerate them as they cross the gap. So let's look at these particles that are here. These are protons, by the way. So they're crossing this gap here. If we want them to accelerate as they cross that gap, what we do is that we charge one of these Ds that they're traveling inside of. These are hollow shapes, by the way. And this side, positive. As they go over, they will accelerate towards the left-hand side. But by the time they come to here, we want them to accelerate over this gap. 
So actually, we have to flip the polarity of the Ds in order to help them accelerate over that way as well. And then they come back here, we want them to do the same. So we are having to flip the polarity of these two Ds every half a turn. So let's just uh, write down our equation that gives us radius again. So R equals MV over BQ. Let's rearrange that for V, shall we? So V ends up being BQR over M. So we have the speed of these particles at any point, but we are going in a circle here. So we need to make sure that the frequency of the applied AC over the two Ds, so it's flipping the polarity back and forwards. We need to make sure that it flips from positive to negative to negative and positive and back again every time the protons do one complete circle. So how long does it take for one of these particles to do one complete loop? That's the time period. That's gonna be equals to two pi r divided by the speed. All this is saying is that time is distance divided by speed. But we know that speed is actually this here. So let's pop that in. We end up with this two pi r divided by bqr over m. We see that the r's cancel. And if we're dividing by the inverse of m, the m's gonna come up on top. So we end up with two pi m over bq. Notice that this does not have radius in. So in other words, the time that it takes for a proton to do one complete circle is independent of the radius. So in other words, all protons cross gap at the same time because T is not proportional to R. So that's kind of cool, isn't it? So no matter where the protons are, whether they're here or here or here, they're all going to cross the gap at the same time. So how do we find out what the frequency is that needs to be applied for this AC? It's just gonna be the reciprocal of this here. So the frequency ends up being BQ over two pi M. So if you know the mass of the protons, hopefully there's gonna be 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27, and the charge, hopefully there's gonna be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and you know the flux density, uh, from your magnetic field, then you can change the frequency of this AC supply to the Ds to account for that, so it's just right. So that's free moving charged particles in magnetic field, and that's the motor effect done and dusted. So if you're okay with that, it's time to move on to electromagnetic induction. If you think I've missed anything, then please leave a comment down below, or if you've got any questions, do the same, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.